two years ago, I made a video on what I thought was the ultimate DVD ripper. And uh, just recently, I've made something so much better. And I'm going to show you how to make it too. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome back to Excelsior Tech. I am going to show you something super awesome today, but before I do that, I want to do just a tiny bit of housekeeping. I made this really cool video about this DVD ripper, and then I kind of disappeared for a while with a few little videos out after that. I wanted to do a lot more, but 2020 was kind of a crazy year for me. Crazy year for everybody, really. Um, but to be honest, uh, 2020 and 2021 was mostly awesome. Like everybody else, so we had the whole COVID thing, and lockdowns and things like that. But that's also the same year that my family introduced our fifth baby. Uh, she's a little hellion. What are you doing? Oh my gosh, no. I am so tired. Got a raise at work. I got COVID. Luckily it was super minor. Everybody's fine. Uh, at the very beginning of 2021, bought a new house. Right before the housing prices, were, they were already kind of getting crazy before they kind of went like this. Uh, so I got really uh, lucky on that. Uh, this new house is awesome. I'm finishing my basement and I'm going to be doing the home theater of my dreams down here. I don't have an unlimited budget, so it's going to be a constrained home theater of my dreams. But I'll show you more of that in another video. And it's going to be awesome. But in all that time, my mind kept thinking about that ripper and a few of its drawbacks, and I'm going to address each one, and we're going to put even more functionality into it, and it's gonna be so much better. This new ripper I've made blows the old one out of the water. The old ripper was awesome, but it had kind of three major drawbacks. First, you had to initiate the, uh, the rips, so you put all the discs in, you'd have to hit a button to get it all started. I fixed that. Now it does it automatically. Second, uh, the DVDs would only rip the largest track. So if you had a double feature or you had a television show disc, it wouldn't do those. That was a really big one. And third, it wasn't simultaneous. It would rip things sequentially. You'd hit the button, have all your DVDs in there. It would rip one disc, next disc, all the way through. It still saved you time, but that's a big drawback. I fixed that too. I stumbled upon this by thinking about the problem that I had with, especially with simultaneous ripping, when it occurred to me that I had a ripper that could kind of do this automatically, but it only did it with one disc. And that was using a distribution called Vortex Box. Vortex Box is a distribution of Linux based upon Fedora, and it's really interesting. It's primarily designed to be a high-end audio streaming and audio playing distribution of Linux but it has a lot of these cool hidden features that I primarily used it for. You can install a Plex server on it very easily. It also has built-in CD and DVD ripping. That's right, it'll rip your audio CDs and your video DVDs and it'll do it all automatically as soon as you put a disc in. So it had this functionality built in. I wanted to do this to where I can do it across multiple DVDs. Now I'm sure somebody who's much more intelligent than I am could figure out a way to do this in a single installation of a Vortex Box. What I'm gonna show you is we can kind of brute force this functionality. It is not too difficult with using multiple virtual machines hooked to physical drives in your system. I'm gonna use VirtualBox, and so any operating system that use VirtualBox, so OS X, Linux, or uh, Windows, you can do this tutorial and make yourself an awesome DVD ripper. As long as you can get direct physical access to the DVD drive, this will work. So, when we're done with this tutorial, you are going to have a ripper. You can do regular DVDs. It can do television DVDs. It can do Blu-rays. It can do 4K DVDs. And on top of that, you can throw in an audio CD and it'll do that as well. It will grab the album information, all the metadata, all the track information, and it will rip them into their own folders and organize them for you. And it'll do this all automatically. And you can do it with multiple discs all at the same time, doing any which function you want. It is so cool. I'm so excited to show you. And I believe that this is the best 
ripper you can have in the entire world. Okay, so a couple last things before the tutorial. Um, this, this ripper is a little more complicated software-wise than the old ripper, so there are more things that can go wrong software-wise, so you may find more hitches in this. I had none after I was done with my instructions that I'll show you, but um, I can see how there could be problems with different types of hardware not playing perfectly with the type of ripper we're making right now. So if you have that kind of problem, use the old ripper. It's a little less complicated software-wise and should be easier if um, something goes wrong. It, it will be more tolerant to different kinds of hardware. And second, the my capture hardware was not very good and um, I had to use a really um, cruddy method of capturing my desktop and so the desktop's a little fuzzy I'm sorry normally it's gonna be a lot clearer this time it's a little bit a little bit fuzzier sorry about that third and final uh, you you've already looked at the timeline this video is really really long I'm sorry I tried making this shorter I, I like making my tutorials step by step so any uh, so people who are just even a little bit adventurous technology wise will be able to do this so if you find yourself just not needing uh, as much of the instruction as I'm putting in there, you can just skip through it. I have chapters down below. Uh, sorry about that, but trust me, it is so worth it. You're gonna love this ripper. And now, on to the tutorial. All right, let's start with the hardware. The hardware requirements for this project is really low. You don't need very much. Pretty much anything that can run Windows 10 the past few years, even has a modest CPU, should be just fine. This computer is really old. It's an HP Compaq Elite 8300. It's about eight years old. It has an Ivy Bridge i5 3470 CPU, and it has eight gigs of RAM. The RAM is important because as you allocate RAM to your virtual machines, you need at least that much in your RAM for your system to be able to handle it. So I'm doing up to six virtual machines at 512 megabytes of RAM for each virtual machine, and this eight gigabytes of RAM is just fine. The next system uh, spec you need to make sure that you have enough of is your SATA ports. This machine has five SATA ports. I'm hooking up three DVDs and two hard drives, one system drive, one storage drive. So this is plenty, but you may have a limitation there and keep that in mind. And uh, that's really it for hardware wise. You really just don't need much. Make sure you can load Windows 10 on it, and then let's go on to our software. Okay, and here we go with a very vanilla installation of Windows. It's just the basic ISO you can get from Windows yourself. And you can do a lot of these instructions from Linux as well. I'm using VirtualBox with a distribution of Linux. And you'll also notice that this isn't the most elegant setup. Uh, I'm kind of brute forcing some functions from that from that distribution that you really could do on your own if you knew how to compile it together with different applications. Also, you can do what I'm doing with a system like Proxmox or something like that. Really, any virtualization that you can get direct access to the DVD drive, you can do this tutorial. So, let's get going. And the first thing we're going to do is click on your Chrome installer and go to the website, the very first website I go to on any fresh installation of Windows, and that is ninite.com. Uh, a lot of you probably know this already. I've made a video about it. It's a super simple and awesome uh, utility for quickly getting any of the freeware programs you want. Get Chrome, we're gonna get 7-Zip, Notepad++, and VLC, which will be handy for previewing things. Then we'll click Get Your Ninite. It'll do a little silent install in the background. And then when it's done, you have those programs installed. It's an awesome little utility. Okay, now it's finished. We're gonna go ahead and close it out. And we're gonna go with download VirtualBox. But first thing I wanna do, because I just remembered, we wanna change the autoplay settings. When you put a disk into an uh, uh, operating system like Windows, it wants to automatically play it and do something with it. We wanna shut that off, because that'll screw us up later. So let's go ahead and type in autoplay and start menu, go to autoplay settings, turn it off. All right, now that that's done, we're going to go back to what we were gonna do before, open up Chrome and download VirtualBox. Now that we're on the download page here, you'll see the platform packages. You wanna get the platform package for the platform you're on, be it Linux, Windows, OS 10, whatever. So we're gonna get the Windows package here, and then we're also going to get the Oracle VM VirtualBox extension pack. This will give us some extra operations with the USB and things like that. I don't know if we have to have this, but I'm pretty sure we do. Go ahead and get this anyways. It's just a good package to get. 
Now that everything's downloaded, go ahead and install the VirtualBox package first. And then after that, we'll do the extension pack. You'll notice when it's installing, it's going to ask you about installing this new adapter. This is a virtual network adapter. You need this because VirtualBox uses this like a software adapter to be able to get to the internet for the virtual machine. So make sure you click yes and install that. And once it's finished installed, let it start VirtualBox, and then we're going to install the extension pack. The extension pack um, requires that VirtualBox is installed first on any platform that you uh, install VirtualBox. The extension pack is the exact same file for each one. It needs VirtualBox. And now we're going to install the extension pack. It might try to open another instance of VirtualBox. You can just close one of them, doesn't matter. And after that's done, we are now ready to install our virtual machine. Now we're going to head back to Chrome over here, and we're going to search for Vortex Box, which is our distribution of Linux we're going to be using in our virtual machine. Then once we get to virtualbox.org, you'll see that it kind of drops you into a forum. It's not the most uh, friendly site. So finding the releases for the downloads that we want to get is not super <laughs> understandable. But I'll show you where to get them right here. So click on the wiki section up top, and then you're going to see right over here in the drive images, the available images link. Click on that. And on this page, you'll see the different releases. 2.4 is the most latest stable image, but we're going to go to the beta here for our tutorial. And conveniently, they already have it in OVF, an open virtualization format, meaning that it's a file we're going to download that's already a virtual machine, a vanilla version of the installation. So we're going to click and download this. And if you're in Chrome like me, you'll notice when you click this, nothing's going to happen. That's because this uh, zip file is not something that Chrome understands. It doesn't know if it's safe, so it's just not going to do anything. So if you right-click and go Save As, you'll notice you'll get a new prompt down below here, and it will tell you, do you want to discard this because it's not sure what it is? Or, and then if you click the little carrot there, and you can get another option saying Keep. Click Keep. And now you can see the download is continuing. And now let's go and find this file. I'm going to click on the little carrot here and go to show in folder. We're going to see it in our downloads folder. I'm going to right click on it now and I'm going to unzip it so that we just have the straight OVF file out of the zip. And now that we have just the OVF file by itself, we're going to go back to VirtualBox and now we're going to import this virtual machine so that we can start to use it and configure it to the ways we need it. Now let's go back to VirtualBox, click the Import button. Now you have this dialog box here. Go ahead and click here to find our virtual machine that we downloaded and extracted. It's inside this folder. Just go ahead and click it and click Open. And now click Next. And here you're going to see where we can give all the resources we need for our, from our virtual machine. This allows us to scale up the needs of our machine up or down. We want to scale it down because I'm not doing anything hefty with these virtual machines. In fact, I need to do it as little as possible. So I'm going to do one CPU, and then when I come down to the RAM here, I'm going to give it 512 megs of RAM. And most of the rest of this you can just kind of leave alone. But we do want to change right here the MAC address policy. We want to make sure it generates new MAC addresses for all the network adapters. This is more important later, as you'll see. And then when we click Start, it's going to pull the file into uh, the, the, the default folder. And when if this is done, you can actually throw away the files that are in the Downloads folder. OK, now it's imported, but let's go ahead and do some additional settings. So let's right click on the VM right here. Go to Settings. We're just going to go ahead and give it a new name. Let's call it Disk1. And we can scroll through some of the settings here. Uh, if we go to network, we want to make sure it stays on bridged. Enable, make sure it's enabled. You might also notice at the bottom here, there's some problems with invalid settings detected. The graphics adapter here wants a different setting. You can go ahead and change it 
to that VSVGA, VMS VGA, I think is what it's called. I didn't notice it being a problem without it, but you might want to do that. You'll also notice there's another one here that's telling you that there's invalid settings for the system processor. So let's go ahead and in the system section here, go to processor. We'll adjust that in a second. Another thing that I want you to take a look at though, the enable PAE slash NX. This is the virtualization ability to be able for your machine to hand off all the functions from the processor directly. This is super important. If you can't enable this or it's grayed out, you need to go to your BIOS and enable virtualization if your processor has that ability. If it doesn't, you can't do this. Google it for your specific machine. It's different for each one. And then um, if you have enable PAE done, then good. Then go ahead and have to make sure that's checked and move on. Click OK. OK, there's now one last thing we're going to do. So if you look down in this PC on your Windows, you can you open up your file explorer, you'll see you'll see all the different disk drives you have. Keep an eye on those. Now you might want to right click on each one and inject them so you know which drive is the first one in the line of ones you're doing. You gotta give them numbers. So I know that this BD-ROM one right here is my top row one. So this is gonna be my disk one drive. I want to attach it to this virtual machine. So I'm gonna come back to the settings in the virtual machine. Then we're gonna head back over here, go to the storage section. And in the storage section, you're going to see IDE or SCSI or some or SCSI. Do it in IDE. There's greater combati compatibility here, but you can do it in the SCSI section if you want. We're going to attach the E drive, which I know is my first one in line, and make sure you have pass through. If you click here, you can also make sure it's using the host drive. So I'm selecting it there, and now we're just making sure it's the host drive. After you're done with that, click OK. And now we're going to start our virtual machine. At the very top here, you'll notice an icon that says Start. There's a couple different ways we're going to use Start. One is a normal way where it opens up a window, which kind of just shows you like a, it's like a virtual monitor of what's going on, and also Headless Start, which we might use later, and I'll show you that later. Right now, we're just going to click Normal Start. And give it a second, you'll see a new window open up. And this is your virtual monitor, as we'll call it. And it's going to show you the boot up screens here. This is this distribution uses Fedora. You'll also notice a couple of dialogues open up on this virtual machine monitor. It, it shows you how your mouse, when you click on here, will be captured. So the inputs will be captured. If I were you, I would just click the little uh, thing over here that's a cross through dialog box that just tells you that it won't open again so every time you open this up that you won't see this dialog every single time but do remember if your mouse goes away and you need to get it back the right control button on your keyboard is what will do it and the very first thing we're going to do is put in root for our user login and the password is vortex box you won't see anything as you type but it is typing it and when you hit enter you'll be logged in now, that's not a very secure uh, type of login there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually change this to a more secure login. So we're going to put in a command, P-A-S-S-W-D, space, the user we're going to change, which is root. Then when you enter, it's going to ask you for the new passwords. Put those in twice. You will not see any dots or anything like that because doing it securely. As soon as you enter and you've done it correctly, all password authentication tokens updated successfully. And we're done. So now, next time you log in, remember, that's the, the password for the root user that you've created. Now we're going to do an update to all the software inside this, uh, this distribution. And you do that by doing a command called DNF. It's different on different distributions, but for this Fedora, it's DNF. Space, dash Y, space, update. The dash Y just means we're going to skip any prompts asking us whether or not we want to actually do any of the updates that it's going to check for. So we're just going to say yes to anything. So the dash Y is there. Hit enter, and then it's going to do an update to the whole distribution all by itself. 
and next we're going to find the IP address of this virtual machine. The reason why we're doing that is because there is a web UI to do a lot of the functions of this machine. There really isn't a lot we have to do in the command line anymore once we get everything configured. So we want to find the IP address so we can actually uh, connect to this machine as if it's like a web page. So to do that, I'm going to click inside the window here. You'll notice this little prompt come up. You can put do not show me this again, but this is just showing you that your mouse and keyboard are now going to be captured. Type in here if config, if, if config. Hit enter, you're going to see some information scroll up here. You want the ETH0 information, and right here where it says INET, and then after that is your IP address for this machine. In my case, it's 10.0.0.14. Now, because we did a bridged adapter, this should be a similar IP address to the one that's actually on the host machine, which is the machine this is on. To do that, it's really easy. We just do a quick check in the command line. So hit the right control to make sure you release your mouse. Go to your start menu. Type in CMD. Open up a command prompt. This is optional, by the way, but this is just so you can see what I'm talking about. Type in IP config, which is the command in Windows to see your IP address. And you can see right there where the IPv4 is 10.0.0.44 for this host machine. So you can see it's a very similar IP address to the one that's on there. And that's because we're using a bridged adapter. This is important, and you'll see why. This lets your virtual machine uh, communicate outside of this host machine if it needs to. And there's an important reason for that, and you'll see why later. Okay, so now we're going to put our virtual machine to the side for a moment. Uh, we're going to do some more configuring on it, but we're going to put it aside and we're going to go to our local machine and we're going to configure our storage. And here's the cool thing about this Ripper. You can use local storage on this machine, so I have a one terabyte drive in here. Or you can use a, a NAS or other network attached storage or, or any other kind of share you might have on your network. And you're going to see how we're going to do this, but first we need to prepare it. So if you have your share already done, you can skip and go to the next step. But if you haven't have your share already done, let's do it right now. And so we're going to use my one terabyte drive right here. And uh, so VirtualBox likes to see a specific set of folders when it opens up its share. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make those folders inside this hard drive. So we're going to open the hard drive. When you do, you'll see I have some stuff already in here that I put in here for the tutorial purposes. You won't, you know, you'll have whatever you have on your drive. But I'm going to make a new folder. I'm going to call it V for Vortex Box. It can be anything you want, anything you want at all. So we're going to open this folder up, though, and we're going to put some more folders inside of it. And there's a very specific folder structure we're going to do. So we're going to make our folder by doing Control-Shift-N. That gives you a new folder. We're going to first make the first folder of music. Now we're going to make the second folder, Control shift n do movies. You um, actually should probably keep things lowercase. So lowercase movies. Then Control shift n again to make a new folder. And we're going to call this one Pictures. We don't actually use this folder, I think, at all. But I think Vortex Box still wants to see it, so go ahead and put it there. But I don't think we're actually even going to use it. Now let's go back to the music folder and open it up. And there's a couple folders we need to put into the music folder. First one's going to be FLAC, F-L-A-C. And then our second folder is going to be Playlist, singular. And the third folder is MP3. And then that should be it for our folder structure. All right, so now we have our folder structure. We're going to want to share this folder so that we can use it with our Vortex Box installation. So I'm going to go back up the top here and click on the storage. And then you'll see the V folder right here with those folders that we just made inside of it. And we're going to now share it. So to share a folder in Windows, we right click on it, go to Properties, Sharing tab. We're going to do Advanced Sharing. We're just going to click on Share this folder. Then for permissions here, this is important. Right now it's shared to everyone. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure it's only to the people authenticated to this host machine. So when you did this machine, you, you made a user and a password for it. So make sure you put in the user right here. This user, I, I called it Trigun, anything you want. 
oops, it's actually tripod. <laughs> Click check users, check names actually, and if it's correct, it'll just automatically fill it out with the computer name, which is the randomly generated name, and the user. Okay, if that, that looks good, go ahead and click OK. And now you'll see my users there. So if when I click on tripod and click on full control, click apply. And because I had unchecked all the stuff for everyone, it went ahead and just erased the user. But you can also just remove it manually yourself. But now my user is the only user authenticated for full control of this folder. That's important. And you need to remember the username and the and the password that you made for this computer. Click close. And now this folder is shared. Now we're going to go back to our virtual machine and configure our virtual machine to see this as its storage section and the mount point that we're going to put in there. Uh, real quick, let's go ahead and I'm going to show you the web UI for the controls of this distribution. So you can see that the IP address is still there. Put in your IP address. Mine is 10.0.0.14. And then when I enter, you'll see this is the web user interface for Vortexbox. And it's really cool. A lot of your uh, controls can be done from here. But uh, first, let's stay on this home screen here. You can see this dashboard. And there's some information here that's really important. So it's showing you the file system, which is all our storage, which is the mount point of forward slash storage. This is what we're going to be altering. Keep an eye on this, this information, because I'm going to show you something cool in just a moment. Put this aside, and we're going to come back to our virtual machine. And we want to now map to the forward slash storage mount point our share that we made on our host machine just a moment ago with all those folders. Now, part of the problem is we don't have the correct utilities in Vortexbox. Vortexbox is a very, very, very bare bones version of Fedora. Uh, there's not many packages that they support in the basic repository. And so we're going to have to actually add um, a repository back into this distribution so that we can then add the correct utilities to make our mapping. I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Here we go. So first, we're going to show you what repositories we have. So we're going to type in DNF repo list space all. And then when you do that, you'll see all the possible repositories we can have on, but all of them have been disabled except for the vortex box packages. That's normal. That's what we want to see. But we want to enable all the regular Fedora packages so that we can add the correct utility. So to do that, we're going to type in DNF space config dash manager space dash dash two dashes set dash enabled space fedora so what we just did is enabled the fedora repo list so we're going to do another dnf repo list space all and this is going to grab all the information for that repo list and then when it shows the list again when it does you'll see there's another green section now that says it's been enabled, the Fedora package list. This is what we needed to do to make sure we can install the next set of utilities. And we're going to go ahead and do that right away. So we're going to type in DNF space install space CIFS dash utils U-T-I-L-S. Now hit enter. Now the package manager is going to install the CIFS utilities. This is absolutely necessary so we can do the next thing to mount. Um, we didn't do a dash Y, so it's going to ask us, do you want to install these things right here that's going to be required for CIFS utility? You say Y, yes, it'll just finish it. Give it a few moments and it'll be done. Now you'll notice a little uh, prompt that just came up at the bottom there through the command line. I don't know why it's throwing that error. Uh, I haven't had any data loss, and so um, I think you can safely ignore it. Somebody smarter than me can tell me how to fix that. That'd be great, but I've used it with this error, and it's been just fine. So you could ignore it, as far as I know. I've been using this ripper for a while, and this error keeps coming up, but it hasn't caused any problem. Anyways, let's move on to mapping this share. 
and I hit enter. Just go ahead and give myself a prompt back, even though just typing will work too. And now we're going to use the special command to mount this folder. Do this carefully. So you're going to type mount.cifs space forward slash forward slash the IP of your host. This is where you're sharing the folder. My host is this computer. So I'll show you again. If I go to do a command prompt IP config, you can see the IP of this host. I'm going to put that in there. Then I'm going to put forward slash the share name of the folder. So the folder I use was called V. You could have called yours V2. Whatever you named your share folder, you put that in there. Space forward slash storage. This is where the mount point is going to be on the distribution here. Space O, not zero, dash O, excuse me. Space username equals the username on your host computer minus tripod, comma, password equals the password for that user on the host machine. I'm going to blank mine out, but you put yours in, comma, domain equals all caps work group just like you see here. Now I know that's a long command and so uh, be careful as you type it. Make sure you did everything correct. And um, I'll have the basic versions of these commands down in the description if you have problems or you want to copy and paste from there. But if you paste, I am xing out the things that you need to fill in. So keep that in mind. Hit enter and then you see this little error here. I don't think that's anything to be a problem either. I'm not sure why it comes up. It's another one of those weird ones. Again, if you can know what it is and know how to alleviate it, let me know. But I think we've got our share working now. So to test this, let's move back to our web UI over to the side. And when you click refresh, check that out. Did you see that? Now look at the size of your forward slash storage. Shows one terabyte and 932 gigs used shows how much that was already stuff, the stuff that I had on there and the available is over 694 gigs. My, my Fedora Vortex Box installation is now mapped with the mount point of forward slash storage to my network drive. Now this is really cool and now I'm going to show you how to make sure that every time you start up this is what it's going to do. It's going to map it correctly. We could do something like messing with the F stab, but frankly, I find that that's not something you want to mess with normally, and there's actually a little bit more of an elegant way that Vortex Box gives you to do this. So that's what we're going to do next, is make it to where you can map this drive every time you start up. All right, so to do this, we're going to come to the prompt here, and Vortex Box gives you a file that you can create to do this, and it's really easy. So we're going to use nano. So I'm going to type in nano, N-A-N-O. We don't have to do sudo because we're root. Space. Now we're going to tell it where we're going to put this file. So it's forward slash opt forward slash vortex box. So I typed in VOR, then tab to automatically autocomplete vortex box. Forward slash now this is the name of the file, post underscore startup dot sh. Type this in exactly. Again, I should have it down in the description. And then when you hit enter, it's going to create a file in the forward slash opt forward slash vortex box folder of post underscore startup dot sh. Now, vortex box is going to look for this file and any commands we put in here, it's going to execute it every time it boots up. Really cool, pretty elegant feature. It leaves a lot of important things alone unless you do the kind of stuff we're going to do right now very easily. So that command line thing that we did earlier, the mount.cifs, you're going to put in that whole thing again. This time, you're going to type it in, in here. Now at the bottom of nano, you'll notice there's a bunch of uh, characters and commands that you can put in. All of those are done by doing control. So we're going to control X, meaning we're going to try to exit this program, but we first want to, it's going to ask us, do you want to save? And we're going to say yes. 
And then when you say, well, you want to save it as, it's going to show you the file that you started it as, and we're going to say, just click enter. And then it, we, congratulations, you made the post underscore startup dot sh file. So now we're going to test it. And to do that's really simple. We're just going to type in at the prompt here, reboot. And then when you hit enter, it's going to restart the entire machine. You're going to see it just as if you were sitting at a computer. If you tried to hit refresh right now, you'll notice that the web UI is not going to work right now. But as soon as it gets back to the prompt and you give it a few seconds, something cool will happen. So as soon as it logs in, it actually still has the old thing on there for a second, but as soon as you click refresh again, because now the, the post underscore startup.sh file has run, you now got your storage back. So now we have done most everything in here. We're, gonna, we're in the home stretch now, guys. Just a few more settings, and we will now be ready to test out this ripper. So now we're going to go back to the web UI, which is loaded here, and we're going to come down to CD Ripper. This is an important place you're going to be at um, a lot of times when you're here. And so this is showing you the DVD ripping options. So any of the Blu-rays, DVDs, 4K Blu-rays, this is using Make MKV to rip the raw tracks into the raw MKV files. But right now it's going to rip all the tracks because we haven't put any limitations on it. So what I'm going to set, tell it to do is we're going to say rip tracks no longer than, and I personally do like 15 minutes, which I believe is 900 seconds. So in this box right here, I'm going to go ahead and put in 900 seconds. And now I've told Make MKV, which is the ripper that Vortex Box is using, to rip any track over 15 minutes. Great for television shows where you have several episodes on one DVD. Um, if you have double features, things like that. Perfect. But if you but if you have features like special features like a, a making of documentary or something, it's over 15 minutes. It's going to rip that too. So keep that in mind. You might get some extra files. I'm going to go ahead and hit submit, and it's going to commit those settings. Now you can see that there's a couple other settings up there for mirror tracks and mirror tracks to M2TS. It's kind of obvious what they do, but I would suggest not checking them right now. All right, so now let's go to our next feature. So not only can Vortex Box rip your video DVDs, it can also rip your audio CDs. And it does this using lossless FLAC. So let's go to the FLAC settings and the FLAC mirror settings. And by default, the FLAC mirroring is just turned on. But you can also tell the FLAC mirroring to also mirror the FLAC files to MP3 files. So you can, if you know what quality you want, I think 160 is plenty, but you can do any quality you want right here. And go ahead and click Enable MP3 Mirroring, and then if you want, do Embedded to Cover Art. I actually think that's a good idea to do as well. So what it's going to do is it's going to mirror the, the FLAC files into MP3s, but it will not get rid of the FLAC files. It's going to be both. So when you, when you put a CD in, it's going to automatically grab um, all the information for it. It's going to automatically, it's pretty cool, it's going to automatically grab the, uh, the artist, album title, all that metadata, and then it's going to rip them into a FLAC file with all that. And then after that, with these settings, you can turn it into an MP3 as well, automatically. And then when you look in your share folder, you'll see both. Now our last and one of our most important settings is right here in the system configuration. There is supposed to be a little button here. I don't know why it's been hidden, but it's supposed to be there. And in, in other versions of Vortex Box, it's there, and it's called License Manager. So it's still there. You can get to it, but to get to it, you need to put in your IP address, and you see how it says system.php? Replace that with License Manager, one word, dot PHP. Hit Enter, and check it out. You're in this like little place right here. You're going to kind of want to keep this in mind because you might want to actually bookmark this. And the reason why you want to bookmark it is we're using Make MKV for our ripper. It's a wonderful DVD ripping tool that rips the raw files for you. It's not freeware. It is um, it is kind of like demoware. And what I mean by that is the license for it uh, needs to be reinserted every 30 days unless you install an update to the to the software itself. This is, uh, they, they say it's free while in beta. It's been in beta for over a decade. 
So I don't see this changing anytime soon. I've used it for a long time uh, with just a code. If you purchase your own code, the code you use will just remain um, perpetually and it never goes out so you don't have to worry about this. So if you purchase it, you have to worry about this at the time. I think this is, goes for about $75. Kind of expensive for, for ripping software, but it's the best and um, it's good to support the, the developers of this software. But if you want to just use it while it's in demo, you can do that. You just have to re-up this this uh, software every 30 days. And to start it off, we need to get the newest code anyways. If you just put in make MKV code into Google, it's gonna be the first link. I'll also put the link down in the description. This post right here, you just need to bookmark this forum post. It will change every single month and there'll be a new code put in there. So copy this code. And then we're going to go back over to the license manager and paste it in. After you paste it in, hit submit, and uh, now you're done. You've licensed it for the next 30 days. There may be a little bit of an overlap from, from when you've made this virtual machine to when you may need to re-up the license. Just go back there when you need to. Check the text here in the CD Ripper. This will tell you if your, your license is out of date, whether or not you need to go back and do it. But uh, yeah, this is actually pretty much it for a complete setup for our first virtual machine. There are some other features here, as you can see, for Vortex Box. Feel free to use them if you want to. But uh, we're now going to move on to our next segment, and that is being able to administrate to our Vortex Box remotely. All right. Now I've swapped over to my laptop. And what I want to do is show you how we can uh, have our ripping machine off to one side, but we can still put this into a place that we can control it remotely using the web UI. For Vortex Box's web UI is really cool. Um, I'm going to open up Firefox because um, I don't want to mess with my, I'm going to go with a fresh browser here. So I'll do Firefox, open it up, and I like using the bookmark bar. So that way we can um, just really easily get to the bookmarks for messing with this ripper. So you might want to do that too, just use a fresh browser. Um, if you don't want these links to be uh, synced up with your profile, say with Chrome. So I'm just going to clean it up here. and. Uh, get rid of some of these things. So what we're going to do is I'm going to put in the IP address of the first disk, which I know for my case is 10.0.0.14. Hit enter, and there you go. You have the web UI from your machine remotely. So all your controls are there. So let's make this really easy. We're going to go to our settings over here, and we're going to show our bookmarks bar. And then I'm going to make a folder that makes a disk one folder. Okay, so we can bookmark any of these links here, but I'm going to go to CD Ripper, which is our disk ripper for all of our disks, CD and DVDs. So we're going to spend a lot of time with getting information from this thing. So I'm going to drag it into here. And then we're going to right click on it. I'm going to rename this. So I'm going to go to edit bookmark. Then I'm going to call it disk one because this is the main place I'm going to go whenever I click on disk one, I want to see what's going on in the CD Ripper. Now the second thing I'm going to do is I want to make sure I have quick access to that license manager. So I'm going to, remember we have to force this link, we don't have a link to easily go to. So forward slash license manager dot PHP, and then I'm going to drag that into my disk one folder, edit the bookmark, call it disk one, license manager. And now we have a link to quickly go to the license manager anytime the error gets thrown that we need a new license. Okay, so now we have it set up to where this first disk can be controlled from a, a computer remotely. So what does this look like if you throw a, D, a DVD in? I'm going to show you. So just throw in a DVD. In a few moments some text will come up. Okay, so I'm going to speed this up a little bit, but you can look down here at the bottom and you're going to see the text in the CD Ripper, something new come up. And when you see there, that's actually the disk starting its scan and then it's going to find the tracks that it needs to rip and then it's going to rip them. And as you can see here, the time will just scroll up. I'm editing through a lot of the time here, so it actually goes about 15 minutes. But when it's done, you'll see it says the track is done and everything was copied correctly. 
So now let's go ahead and hop over to the Ripper machine and I'll show you in this place where it's been saved. We told to save in the V folder, so I'm gonna go to movies. I put in the undercover blue DVD. It just ripped it all by itself. It did nothing but just shove it in and named it and everything. And you can see right here, there's the movie. Worked perfect. And now you have a perfectly working automatic ripper for this first disc. So that was for DVD. What about for audio CD? So I'm gonna throw in my favorite CD and you'll see in a second, the text will change at the bottom here and it's going to get the metadata, get all the different tracks, and then you can even see it encoding the tracks and you can see its progress down here in the CD Ripper section. All right, so we're finished now with everything for this first disc, but you can see we have two other drives here. So I think you kind of know what I'm gonna do. VirtualBox can very easily clone this first disk with all of our settings, including the mapping to the, the V drive and everything, all with just a few clicks. Let me show you. So we're just going to go on up to our virtual drive here, disk one. We're going to go to clone. And I'm going to do this right here, MAC address policy. Make sure you put on generate new MAC address. This makes the clone appear to be a completely different computer because the MAC addresses for the Ethernet inside of it is different. So we're going to give it another name as well. So let's go up here, call it disk2. Okay, so now I'm going to go down to next, click next. If you do a full clone, it's going to copy all of the files to the, to the new machine on your computer. You don't have to do this. It takes a little bit longer. It doesn't take very long, but it does take a little bit longer. My suggestion is to do a linked clone, so it's going to take kind of like a, kind of like a fork of the first virtual machine and just use that. And it's a much smaller file, and it's very quickly, almost instantaneous. I, I, you don't, this is what I would do. You don't have to do the full clone, but either way will work. So I'm just going to do a link clone, click clone, then instantaneously I've got the new disk here. So keep in mind, disk two now has every single setting that includes the setting that makes it linked to the wrong physical drive. So we want to uh, make sure it's connected to a physical drive, the DVD number two. So you can see here the network is different. I'm gonna go over here to storage and you see where it says drive E. I know by messing with my drives that the next one is drive F. So I just changed it and that's it. Click OK. Make sure pass through is on. You're done. And that's it for disk two. And uh, we still have disk three, right? So we're going to clone it off of disk one again um, for linked cloning, I believe you do need to link it off of the main drive, so I'm going to do another link, disk 3. Again, I'm going to make sure in my MAC address policy, I do the generate new MAC addresses, linked clone, click clone. Now we're going to also make sure that our physical drive is correctly set up. Go back to storage, go to drive E, and I know this one's going to be drive G. And now, You've done it. You have multiplied your DVD rippers with just a few clicks. And you can scale this up to as many physical drives as you have access to. But there is one last thing we need to do with each of these clone drives. We need to get a little bit of information. We need to know what IP address is on each of these new cloned uh, disk drives because these new VMs have new uh, IP addresses when they start up. And we want to be able to administer to them remotely. So let's go ahead and load up our second drive. And then once we get in there, we're going to do an if config. And just as we did with disk one, we're going to look at the ETH zero. I'm highlighting it here and where it says INET, that's our IP address. In my case, it's 10.0.0.15. It'll be different for you, but that's mine. So now take that IP address zip on over to your other machine. I'm here I'm popping over to my laptop. I'm gonna do the exact same thing I did with this one. I'm gonna do with this too.
Okay, we're all done. I'm going to zip over to the system configuration and click power down. You don't have to do this part, but I just wanted to shut down all my VMs when I'm done with it. So you just shut it down. If you go back to your other, uh, your ripping machine, the host machine for your VMs, you'll see that it's powered off. Now we're just going to do the same thing for disk three. And again, I'm going to system configuration, powering down. I'm doing this because uh, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to do this because I'm going to show you a way to start them up in a better way on the host machine in just a moment. So we're back here on the host machine. What we can do, see they're all powered off right now. So we can actually just do click on one, hold down shift, click on the last one. And then we've selected all of them. And now, instead of opening them up with a screen that opens up, we can just do headless start. Go ahead and click that. It's warning you that it might take a lot of resources to do all three at once. You're just going to say, yeah. Click OK. And then, all the machines will silently in the background without a screen popping up. You'll see a little preview off to the right there, but they'll just start up. And now your ripper is completely set. All right, and there you go. You made it. You made it all the way through this tutorial. Congratulations, you now have the best ripper in the world. I am so excited to hear from people who are getting this working. Um, a little caveats that I didn't explain in the video. There is some hardware overhead when you keep adding all these virtual machines on there. So if you have a very old machine or a machine that can't handle uh, a lot of um, a lot of RAM being taken up because each time you make one of those machines, that amount of RAM that you allocated for that machine is what is taken up from your system. So you have those kind of con uh, considerations. But that being said, I was able to add up to uh, six different CDs on here. So I had the three internal, and then you can plug in USB ones as well, and you can just map those because they get drive letters. Map those just like you would the others. It's awesome. And then you just start plugging away and putting in CDs, and, and as they pop out, put in another one. So awesome. I'm so excited to hear about what people do with this. Alrighty. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't. I'm going to do a lot more cool videos like this. And uh, take care.